on the high speed uh, highways. Now this time we build high speed railways. So uh, so it's still very useful. It's still very uh, very good uh, investment in general. I think. So so that's one thing I want to emphasize. So another thing I want to emphasize is that uh, let's take a look at this graph. Which year we have fastest growth? This one, 1984, we have fastest growth. And the second fastest is this one. This one is because, you know, Mr. Benjamin had a trip to the southern part of China. So I'm going to explain that a little bit. And this one is the time I came back to China. Okay. So, uh, so 1984, this is a Unbelievable. China's GDP was growing at 15%. Okay. 15%. How did we do that? I will say that no, there's no WTO, there's no any special thing. It's just a very good year. Very good year in terms of what? Very good year in terms of agriculture. Well, it was a very good year in terms of agriculture, but agriculture was not only driven by uh, good weather. So 1984, China's GDP was able to grow so fast is because in the three parts of the economy, agriculture, industry, and service sector, agriculture in that particular year was growing at 8%. So if the agriculture grows at 8%, in the industry grows at 20%, then it's, it's, so that's why this grows at 15%. But uh, in, a, in, a, in a fast growing economy, industry grows at 20% that's not a very strange thing. The strange thing is that why agriculture was able to grow at 8%. Because agriculture, you know, it's very difficult to, to grow. It's constrained by nature's law, you know. So, so usually 1% growth is, is very good. But this year, agriculture grows by 8%. How do we do that? This is not only because of the weather. This is because of reform. So this is a reform. That is not only important to China, but important to the whole world, to human society, to human history. Why? Because we did a very important reform, which is called uh, China's rural, rural uh, uh, land contract system. Rural land contract system. So what is the system? So very simple. Before this system, before the reform, China's rural land, the same as urban land, belongs to the group. Belongs to the group means that we do not have private, you know, any control over the land. If you don't have any control, then how do you do agriculture farming? Then you are like a worker. Every day we we work in the public land. And at the end of the year, then we count everyone's effort and we allocate according to each one's effort. This is a very inefficient system. Because if you work in a public land, what do you do? I can shirk. I can free ride. I don't need to work very hard. And I'm just like an agriculture, I'm just like a farming slave. So if efficiency is extremely low in the collective farming. So it's called collective form. So China couldn't feed their own people because the collective form is very inefficient. So then we, we did a reform. We said we contract the land to individual farmers. We contract the land to farming households initially for 30 years. It's still a public land publicly owned, but it's a long lease to a farming household. So they can have the land for 30 years, and the 30 years is over, then automatically renew for another 50 years. So now they work on their own land. They work very hard because it's all my own stuff. I just pay fixed rent to the state, and then the rest is all mine. So I have to work very hard. So this is a very important reform. This reform has no controversy. 
Because the fact is that agriculture productivity improves very fast. Agriculture GDP grows very fast. Now the fact is that China was able to feed their own people. For the first time in Chinese 3,000 of history, China, in a statistical level, not saying that there's no hungry people in, the, in China, but uh, statistically, China eliminates famine, eliminates hunger. So, so famine is always a very big problem in Chinese society. But since 1980, since 1984, Chinese government eliminated the famine as a statistical level. So this is not only, of course, this is not only important to China. This is important to human society because Chinese population is one quarter of world population. So the first thing is reform, reform in the rural. And then we did. We have what about urban? What about urban? What is the situation in urban economy in China? In the 1980s, China's urban society, urban sector, full of SOEs. Urban is full of state-owned enterprises. Okay. These SOEs, we have very big, advanced SOEs, but they have a lot of small SOEs, cotton textiles. Very small SOEs, many of them. And because SOE has a very big problem. Why? Because who's the owner of the SOE? State. Who's the, who's the managers? Managers are actually those specific people who are appointed by the state. And their interests are not in the same case in many cases. So we have a very very important problem in economics, we say, because principal agent problem. Okay. We have a, in SOE, the biggest problem is principal agent problem. Principal agent problem. Their interests are not in the same pace. But uh, the problem is that this principal is very busy. It's a state. The state is taking care of big things. How can I take care of all the small factories? So this is very much an insider control factory. Asian can sacrifice the factories for their own benefits. So that's why SOE is in a very, very bad situation. So what did we do? There's no solution in the 1980s. So 1980s, we, could, we don't know what we do. We already did a very big thing in rural, so we have no time to deal with urban. So in the 1980s, the only thing we do is that, okay, I, I don't know what to do with SOE. Then why I just uh, let go of the private firms? I free the private firms. In the 1980s, we say, okay, private firms are allowed in China. And, uh, and also foreign firms are allowed in China. So in the 1980s, China's industry was able to grow fast, not because of SOE, but simply because of the fast growth from private firms and foreign firms. We keep that part stable, just leave it there. So in 1990s, we couldn't do that. Why? Because you know the private firms and the foreign firms grow so fast, and then they attract a lot of labor force there. Those people who work in these advanced firms, they receive much higher pay. But in the same time, SOE, those people who stay in SOE, they, you know, they were, those firms were losing money. They couldn't get their, the, the, the workers couldn't get their wages, they couldn't get their pay. That situation was very bad. Mm -hmm. So it comes to the point that we have to deal with that. We have to reform the SOE. How do you think we should reform SOE? In this world, is there any good way to form, reform SOE? There's no way to reform SOE. There's only one way. Sell it. Privatize it. There's no other solution. 
Russia. Okay, see, right. So Russia did the shock therapy, big bang reform. Russia privatized all the SOE in a very short period of time. So that's why in short period of time, Russia has so many billionaires. Because when you privatize it, how do you evaluate the price? It's a lot of manipulation inside. So a lot of billionaires came out. It's the same factory. It's SOE. It's losing money. When it's privatized, the same factory, it began to earn a lot of money, become very profitable. You know, it's because of incentive structures is wrong. So, how about China? We are gradual reform. So we don't say we do privatization. We do another thing. Okay? This is China's East, Eastern wisdom. <laughs> so, so we do another thing. We say, for us, the big, cut loose the small. This is China's strategy. What do you mean? So what, what do we mean? So this is by the Prime Minister Zhu Rongji. So, so he said, we just uh, let go the small SOEs. What do you mean let go? It's the same term as private tax, right? So we just don't say private tax. And it has, has, has a difference, because privatization in, the, in Russia is upside down. Uh, no, no, sorry, so from up to the bottom level. It's all designed by the top government. But in China, this cutting loose the small is actually saying that how do you deal with your SOEs in, in local government? Whatever you want to do with that, I, I approve. I just let you go. You can do whatever you want. But uh, the thing, the central government want to do is I want to control the big SOEs. Where are the big SOEs? In what sectors? So most of the SOE, big SOEs are in the sectors with the feature of natural monopoly. Now this term, natural monopoly, what, what, for example, you tell it here, they say telecom, energy. So, yes, SOE is retreating. But SOE is retreating to the upper stream of the whole industrial sector. They are in the resources, in the, in the telecoms, in finance. But in the manufacturers, it's very much privatized. It's a very big thing in China. You know, in a very short period of time, privatization took place in all over China. And, and in, exactly in this period of time, you see, because privatization, if you are a business owner, I guess many of you want to be a business owner. If you are a business owner, you took over uh, SOE, what is the first thing you want? This SOE is losing money. What is the first thing you want to do? The first thing if I want to do is what? Anybody guess? Fire people. You know, the first thing I want to do is fire people. Because the old SOE, they usually hire more than what, what they want. The first thing I want to fire people. So 90, around 19, between 1995 to 2000, these five years, Chinese SOEs, a lot of Chinese SOEs were privatized. So many people, we don't say, we're fired, we say, laid off. <laughs> laid off, in precise definition in economics, means temporarily take a break and waiting to be called back. Why not? But if you want to wait to be called back, then you will lose your hope. So it's unemployment. So many people got iron. So 1995 and onwards are the years that China's inequality became a big concern. Because when they have their job, at least they have a very low wage, but the wage to support their basic life. But when they lost their life, lost their job, then sometimes become some people become rich. 
They do their own business, but some people are very poor. So inequality rose very fast after 1995, China began the SOE reform. So those are the reforms. I'm going to come back to this reform because this related so much with today. So the last reform, very important reform, I want to talk about 